In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. A few years back when, I believe it was the popular revolution of 2011 occurred in Egypt, there were many political commentators talking about like the, how fragile a society is, how quickly it can turn, in just a blink of an eye. And one of the things that people talk about that triggered it was that people couldn't afford to put food on the table, right? That the, um, the government had crossed over a certain boundary and had consumed so much from the people and were not really providing them an opportunity that the, the society kind of uprose and, and, it, and it snapped. And one of the things that you'll find throughout human history or world history is that governments have always tried to find like this really fine, delicate balance between oppression or taxation and services for the people. And the Roman government at this time had actually, I think, mastered this, um, this balance between oppression and taxation and services for the people. But one of the things that they realized that was very needed or very important was to have insiders who could make sure that Yes, taxes were collected, but also make sure that no one slipped through the cracks, that no one would be able to, um, to get by their system of oppression. And specifically within the Jewish population, which was a really close-knit or tight-knit community, to make sure that these people did not get through the system somehow. And so the Roman government decided to employ people from within who would make sure that nobody would get by their system of taxation. These people, of course, were seen as traitors. They were hated by the society, by their own people. They, they despised them. And one of these people is who we just heard about this morning, Levi, also known as Matthew. He was a tax collector, and he was considered... A traitor. And because of this, because people hated these folks, they needed to be really well incentivized. They were given the opportunity for a great deal of wealth and access. They lived in the best neighborhoods. They wore the best clothing. They had the nicest food. They had to have security details. These people had access to people in positions of power because they needed to be incentivized to continue living that life that caused them to be despised. I think sometimes that Matthew must have hated this sin, but he really loved the benefits that came along with this sin. He must not have loved being a tax collector, right? Nobody like probably wakes up and is like, I want to be a tax collector, but Matthew probably thought to himself, man, I really am attached to the benefits that come along with being a tax collector. And I'm convinced that most people are not really like, they don't love the sin that they're doing, but they love the way it makes them feel or the benefits that come along with it, so to speak. <laughs> and so I don't think most people love lying, but many people lie because it helps them to protect themselves or guard themselves or create a false image of themselves in front of, of others. I don't think most people like cheating on their taxes, but a lot of times people are afraid that they don't have enough money or they just want a little bit more. Maybe there are issues that the scripture says that the, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and so maybe it's a second sin that feeds the other one. I met yesterday a heroin addict while we were in Trenton and with tears in his eyes, he told me, I, I, I hate this sin. I hate, I hate this addiction. I want to stop. This man had gone to numerous Narcotics Anonymous meetings, different rehabs, inpatient, outpatient. He said he hated it, but he also acknowledged that he was trying to numb the pain of betrayal that he had experienced from someone who he really deeply respected many years ago, and so he turned to that life. But the truth is, sin is still sin. And it has some really negative, dark impacts on 
those who fall into that life of sin. This sin specifically really isolated Matthew. He was completely alone. His family hated him. His friends didn't want to talk to him. The people that he grew up with, they didn't want to deal with him anymore. He was completely alone. He would walk through the marketplace, and I'm sure he heard whispers, filth, traitor, sinner, pig. People despised Matthew. Nobody wanted to touch him. As Imagine as he was walking through the market that a group of boys might have been so compelled because of all the things that they had heard their parents saying at home about these tax collectors just to, to spit on Matthew as he walked by and to ridicule him or throw rocks at him. So one of those days he must have ran quickly back to his, his tax booth. And as he ran, the faster he ran, the angrier he got. He thought to himself, I'm going to show these people. Right? Because hurt people hurt people. Many of, many of us are not very different, though, from, from Matthew. Our sin may not be tax collection. We know our sin. And perhaps sometimes our sin is a little bit more hidden than Matthew's. Matthew's was out on full display. He had a booth that was announcing his sin, so to speak. But yet, our sin still has that same impact of isolating us. And maybe it causes us to be estranged from a spouse or from our parents, from siblings or from friends, or even possibly from ourselves. Because sin can be very isolating. Sometimes because of the sin that we carry, we walk into church and we feel completely alone. And if we're honest, unfortunately, sometimes churches and whether it's clergy or congregants can deal with people in such a way like those little boys would have treated Matthew in the marketplace, cursing him and throwing stones at him insulting him and spitting on him. Maybe not literally spitting on him, but with their words, with their looks, with their eyes, with their glances, with their movements of their heart of judgment. The loneliness, I think, for Matthew wasn't even the worst part. It was a sense of shame that he had. Knowing who he was and knowing how people looked at him and how it must have continued to eat him away at, at night he was cut off from the community and he was disconnected from God tax collectors were seen as completely unworthy of forgiveness and so there was a sense of shame that he would walk around with his whole life are there tax collectors among us? you bet you there are people that live among us that feel the sense of loneliness, the sense of shame, the sense of not being accepted, that they are unforgivable in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about sins that are far worse in your book, at least, or in our book. Okay? Maybe someone lied to you or gossiped about you. Man, like unforgivable sin. Shame on them. They are not worthy of forgiveness. They need to be cut off. There may be those who keep standing up, standing you up rather, showing up late. They tell you they're going to be there and then they just don't show up. These people need to be cut off. Unforgivable sin. Because of course, your time is valuable. It's the most precious thing that there is. For others, it's dealing with arrogant people, shame, unforgivable. Sometimes we want nothing to do with these people. And so we're quick to cast stones, to cut off, to throw them out. I want you to re remember the parable of Christ when he told them, the, the disciples, about those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and that they despised others. 
He goes on and he says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners or robbers, unjust, evildoers, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Man, there was a great shame in being a tax collector. And none of us are tax collectors, but I think many of us carry around the sense of shame of how it is that our sin impacts us and how it is that we view ourselves in context to God. Matthew 9, 13, Jesus says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I've come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. And I think it must have been in that moment when Matthew was running back and he saw this group of men and women. They were laughing. They were encouraging one another. And Jesus turns to him and he says, follow me. Follow me. That's all he wanted was to be in a group of people that would accept him. And I think Matthew must have realized, wait, wait, this is the one that everyone's talking about. This is Jesus who everyone is speaking about. This is the wonder worker. This is the healer. This is the one who's going around that the crowds are following. And he's turning to me and telling me to follow him. And think about the tension that Matthew must have felt. Follow him? Leave everything behind, everything that he worked for? His wealth, his position, his power, his status? Follow me. Follow me. And for some people, it's not the tax booth. It's those hidden sins. Right? Jesus says, follow me. Leave that sin behind. But there's an attachment to the sin in our life. There's an attachment. Sometimes it reaches the point of an addiction where we just cannot let go. We can't do it. And so Matthew was sitting there thinking like, do I let go of this? Am I able to? Was this some sort of a joke? Was he going to shame me like everyone else did at some point? Just play me like all the other people had? Follow me. Jesus repeated those words. Follow me. He was being serious and Matthew knew it. And so immediately, with those two simple words, Matthew knew that he was forgiven. He knew that he was forgiven. He knew that how everyone saw him, how everyone ridiculed him, how everyone put him down, how everyone spit on him, how everyone rejected him, that he was forgiven. And that Jesus wasn't here to condemn him. And this is important because many of us show up to church and we feel isolated and we feel ashamed and we hear the words, follow me. And yet we carry this burden of unforgiveness and that we are not forgivable and that there is no hope for us. And so Jesus says, follow me. He offers Matthew and he offers us a new life. He offers us a new life. He offers us a new identity. Matthew looked at Jesus and knew that he could trust him. Yesterday, this heroin addict that I met said to me, you know, one of the reasons that he turned to addiction was that he had this mentor that he really looked up to. And without going into all the details, it was a mentor from church that he really looked up to. And um, he betrayed him very badly. And um, really quite ugly what happened. I mean, the man was in tears and he was speaking in Spanish. The woman who was translating for me was in tears. I was in tears. It was brutal. And um, a lot of times people look and they're like, we don't know that we can trust because people are wounded and they betray. But Matthew looked in the eyes of Jesus and he knew that this was one that he could trust. That Jesus was unlike others. 
Jesus was different. Jesus could be fully trusted. And we're called we're called by that same loving and trustworthy Christ, that same Jesus, who we sometimes look and say, like, I believe, but I don't know, can I trust? Does he really have my best? I've been hurt by others. I've been hurt by people in the church. I've been rejected. I've been shamed. I've been isolated. And Christ is saying today, trust me, follow me, walk with me. Come after me. And in the blink of an eye, everything changed for Matthew. His whole life was transformed. He left his old life behind. He left behind his source of sin. He left behind his separation from God. He left behind his lying and deceit. He became a new creation because whoever is in Christ is a new creation. And old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. He was no longer simply Matthew the tax collector. He was Matthew the disciple of Jesus Christ who was once that guy who was a tax collector. Like I think about Saul, St. Paul. St. Paul was no longer just the guy who persecuted the church. He was St. Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, who by the way used to be the guy who persecuted the church. It was no longer, his past was no longer a shame. It was a symbol of the absolute transformation that happens when a person encounters the loving grace of God, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He was completely unforgivable, but Jesus looked past it and he saw who he was. Because of that, he called him. And because he was called, he responded. And when he responded, he left behind all that was holding him back from living a life of freedom. And Jesus calls each one of us, follow me, turn to me. Leave behind your tax booth and come after me. And you say, but my sin is too big. And he says, follow me. And you say, but I'm completely alone. He says, follow me. Say, but people have rejected. He says, follow me, walk with me, turn to me. One of the things that's really beautiful is that the, the, the scripture distinguishes for us between forgiveness and reconciliation because Christ says to him, you're forgiven. And he lets go of the past. He lets go of the sin. But then he also is not just forgiven. He becomes reconciled unto God. We're told that Jesus was having a dinner in Matthew's house. And many other tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. He wasn't just forgiven. He was reconciled unto God. St. Matthew's story reminds us that the grace of God cannot just forgive us, but can return us and restore us into a right relationship with God. Yes, brothers and sisters, you're forgiven. You're forgiven because of who Jesus Christ is, because what he's done. But he calls us to follow him and to let go of our sin, to follow him and to be reconciled to him. One of the beautiful things about this passage is not just that Matthew was reconciled, but he must have thought to himself, wait a sec, if Jesus forgives me and he's inviting me to have a meal, that means I can invite some of my friends to also come have a meal. Because he sat and all these tax collectors were sitting around him. Like, think about what Matthew must have done. Matthew must have gone around and said, hey, hey, listen, guys, you're never going to believe Jesus, the great teacher, the wonder worker, the prophet, the, like, he didn't know fully, right? He's figuring it out. But he says, you're never going to believe Jesus told me to come follow him. And he had a meal with me. And he's coming to my house, and you got to come meet him. 
And friends, that's what Christ is calling us to do. <laughs> freely received, freely give. Freely received, freely give. You've received the grace of God. Don't hoard it to yourself. Give it on to others. Share it with others. The work that God is doing in your life, share it on to others. And last thing that I'll, I'm compelled to say is you and I have been forgiven a great deal. When Matthew got up and he left the tax booth, he left all the symbols of his sin. And I, I must imagine as well that Matthew, as he walked by those people that cursed at him, that sinned, like that threw stones at him, that spit on him, that Matthew, a part of him must have felt like, what do I do with these people? How do I respond to these people? But I also imagine that Matthew must have looked at them with eyes of compassion and mercy and forgiveness as well. Because freely he had been forgiven. And so freely he was going to forgive them as well. And so this morning, I encourage you to, yes, walk in the grace of God that's been given to you. Be reconciled unto God. And as a result of that, or as a result of what God has done unto you, extend forgiveness onto others. Let God's grace work in you and through you to be also a source of healing. Not a caster of stone and, and insults, but one who is seeking to reconcile others onto God as well. All glory be to his name forever. Amen.